everyone. Welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. I'm Meredith Hutchison-Hartley. I'm Frank Hutchison. And I'm Emily Geddes. And today we're going to be talking about some of the oldest businesses of the world that focus on hospitality, specifically hotels and food and restaurants. Uh, when we look at the list of the oldest businesses, over and over again, these oldest businesses are tied to this basic need, which makes sense because as long as there have been people, they've wanted to travel places eat food, and not get eaten by a bear or stabbed in their sleep while they're traveling, which is pretty reasonable. I think so. Mm -hmm. So um, what we're going to talk about is the oldest restaurant in Europe, and then we're going to talk about the oldest one in Japan. And frequently on lists, what we found is that one or the other was included, but not both, which is fascinating because one is from 803, and the other is from 703. And they're, I mean, they're, and for all we know, they predated that. That's just the earliest record we have. And Emily, you actually have personal experience with this. I do. Back in the, I'm going to date myself here, uh, fall of 1998, I did a semester abroad in Europe. We lived in Vienna, but we did kind of side trips to a bunch of other places. And one of those places was Salzburg in Austria. And while we were there, the long weekend that we were there, one of the places that we visited is St. Peter's Abbey. It has been for hundreds and hundreds of years a center of, of learning and education, uh, but it also has Stiftskeller Sankt Peter. It's a, the oldest restaurant in Europe. And the reason that they say that is because they have a mention from Alcuin, uh, who was a scholar and advisor to Charlemagne in his writings to Charlemagne and he stopping at this restaurant in 803, as Meredith mentioned. Uh, so as we're wandering through Old Town Salzburg, we see the sign that, that in German basically says, Charlemagne ate here. And we said, wow, we can't pass that up. So we went inside and um, it's been renovated since then, redesigned. But it was a lovely little restaurant, very, very good quiche as I wrote in my journal at the time, and they delivered rolls to our table that were also very good, but we didn't realize they were charging us separately for them. One of the reasons I think this restaurant is so uh, has such longevity is because of its connection to the abbey, to the monastery there and the monks. In particular, they made wine, and that was a, a big draw for people. Mm -hmm. The monastery was providing their, this, their own wine. In fact, it wasn't until 1803 that uh, they were allowed to start brewing beer and serving beer there. Uh, so up until then, it was just their own wine. But having this connection to the abbey, which was itself this long-standing institution, helped this restaurant last as long as it has. Well, and they've, they've been continuously owned by the Abbey. Mm -hmm. So yep. the same owner for they centuries. Didn't, yes. It's been owned by the Abbey the entire time. It wasn't leased out until 1992. And then it's since been leased to a different person, I believe, in 1999. But yeah, continuous ownership uh, by the monastery, by the Abbey, um, is definitely a major factor in its longevity. And they've survived um, other interruptions. I mean, they survived, um, you said World War II? Yep. In both World War I and World War II, they were uh, looted during the war, particularly for their alcohol. Um, but they they survived that. They've been a stop for everyone from, from Faust to Haydn. I mean, everyone. Salzburg was a major center of, of culture and education. Everybody who was anybody went through Salzburg at some point. Uh, so and we'll actually be talking about Salzburg in a later episode. Mm -hmm. We talk about um, salt. Yeah, when we talk about mm -hmm. salt. So <clears throat> it sounds like it. I mean, probably not just during the World Wars. I mean, it survived centuries of political upheaval and religious upheaval. Mm -hmm. well, but it's certainly this really basic need. Yeah, being attached to the Abbey mm -hmm. was a, a protection of sorts. Mm -hmm. And people, mm -hmm. I mean, flocked to abbeys throughout the Middle Ages. There were people went for, I mean, to get their health taken care of, education. Mm -hmm. uh, they, if there was issues with food, they always had these primary stores and health care. So that's, what was it like? I mean, walking in and sitting down and eating, what was the atmosphere like? Honestly, I remember it being like dark, almost candle lit. Mm -hmm. I, I think they were going for that kind of ambiance. And again, it's it's been seventeen mm -hmm. years or so, and and from what I've seen online, they've done quite a bit of redesign and renovation. But it was it was very heavy on the ambiance. Mm -hmm. They were very proud of the fact that they were very old. In fact, that is really a marketing tool that they have. They yes. use the fact that they're old, oh, that well, Charlemagne ate here. That's the reason we walked in the door, because mm -hmm. they had the sign across Zeit 803, or 803, mm -hmm. and um, 
Charlemagne ain't here. That's why we walked in the door. And it's also interesting because I looked up uh, the ranking of restaurants mm -hmm. in the town, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that. But Neuna Arweiler. Yes. Thank you, um, our German expert. They have, of the 102 restaurants, they are listed number one. Although it's also interesting, they're not the highest rated, but they are listed number one because they are the attraction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we see this a lot. And I want to transition to talking about the oldest re restaurant and hotel in Japan, which is Nishiyama Onsen Kejunkan. Uh, in Japan, there's this concept um, of the shimise, which is a word that means a long-established restaurant or shop that generally have generations of expertise behind them. They actually have a word for that in Japan. Here we just call them really, really, really old businesses. But this word has, to some degree, a cult following. People study them, and it means very specific things to them. Now, this particular hotel uh, was founded back in the 700s. 703. Yeah. It's by a hot spring. And it's been continually operated for 1,300 years. It's existed since before Charlemagne was the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Its founder was Fujiwara Mahito, and he was a aide to Emperor Tenji. He built this hotel back in his home prefecture, and he invited these famous shoguns and samurai to come and soak in the hot springs that were there because it was a, a health attraction, and he was bringing business back to his hometown. It survived. It's had 52 continuous generations in the same family taking care of this hotel. And there are other families involved. In fact, in many cases, specific posts within the hotel are still manned by the same family members of these, these different families. So one family is responsible for the cleaning of the hotel. One family is responsible for the food of the hotel. Another one's responsible for the management. These are traditions that show up in Japan frequently. What's really interesting about them is that they attract people from all over Japan, and they always have, but they really made their name by serving the local population. They became known as the place where the, if you were a military leader, a uh, literati, if you were a even just someone who had some money, a good merchant who wanted to eat some food, you came to the Nishiyama because it served people so well that they built this local customer base. And they didn't just do it once. They created a tradition where generations and generations would come back. You would go there with your parents. You would bring your children there, your grandchildren there. So they had this core of repeat business. And then if people came to visit their area, they'd say, where's the best place to eat? So of course, people would refer them to Ishiyama Onsen Kijukan. The other thing that's really fascinating about them is that in the Western world, we tend to refer to it as stability with flexibility. But there, they refer to it as tradition with innovation. They've maintained this tradition of service. In fact, here in the U.S., we say the customer is king. Well, in Japan, they say the customer is God. And they put this real focus on their employees and their customers. While still pivoting and changing with the times and adding new services and adapting, they still have this respect for the tradition of where they came from which is critical to how they've lasted so long. And they've stayed pretty small. A lot of companies feel like they have to expand and get bigger and bigger and open new franchises, and they've never done that. In fact, most of the oldest businesses in Japan have never done that. They've focused on their one location and making it better and better and better. I think that's really part of what that tradition and innovation means, is that we do something well, and that's where the stability comes from. Basically, what they've done is they've preserved that which is what mm -hmm. helped them be in the first place, at the same time, they're willing to change with the times as necessary to continue the tradition. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, I mean, they're really dedicated to service. There are more than 5,000 companies that are older than 200 years. At least 56% of them, which is about 3,000 companies, are Japanese. And part of that goes back to this idea of shinisei, that they actually have a word, there's a reason for it, and once you can name it, you can learn from it. Which is interesting because they acknowledge this history, this is part of what we're trying to get to as we study all these businesses. Because they can name the history and recognize the history, they have more companies that last longer. We should also have a caveat on that because there's some other issues mm -hmm. and factors that go into it. One is how the government influences business, and we'll have a separate episode on that. But just because you have, you can identify it doesn't always mean that you do it. Mm -hmm. But these are companies and businesses that have really 
basically learn how to pass it on. Mm-hmm. And they had some other factors going for them, like we've discussed. Right, being connected to the abbey or the monastery, religion mm-hmm. is often a stabilizing mm-hmm. longevity force. Or in Japan being tied to a hot spring. In fact, Frank went and looked at a lot of the oldest hotels in Japan, and almost all of them are associated with a hot spring, which was a major source both of uh, religious devotion mm-hmm. and of health. In fact, when you look at the commonalities between both St. Peter's and the Nishiyama. Nishiyama, what you see is that tied themselves to a famous person. Uh, it's the equivalent of George Washington slept here. One was founded by an advisor to the emperor, and the other one the emperor visited, so well, he yeah. had them documented. Yes, mm-hmm. and then they used that to say, hey, if they were here, you ought to be here too. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, just kind of like we have you know, George today. Washington. Like celebrities eat at the ivy, and yes. we have pictures of that. I mean, we still right. see this pattern mm-hmm. being used. Yes. King Kardashian was here, therefore you too mm-hmm. should be here. So we have that type of connection, that marketing, if you will. There is a health connection because they served alcohol that they created, Which or was the a hell hot springs. Tonic. Yeah, and it was. Mm-hmm. When the Don't water realize. was not safe to drink, the yes. wine was. Yes, mm-hmm. and people just learned that hey, people who drank wine lived. People who drank water died. There's always that aspect of it. One is that you do have this mechanism for continuous ownership. Which they approached very differently. They did. Mm -hmm. But the ownership has been continuous. Mm -hmm. Either it's been kept within the family, and sometimes the family was broadly defined. Mm -hmm. In Japan, it's common for a a son to be adopted into the family. So if a man Mm -hmm. marries a woman from a family that has a strong business heritage, they could be adopted in to stay within that family. Or in many cases, they will hire someone who simply does so well that they are, again, adopted into the family. And that's one of the ways that they maintain this longevity is because you join this, this family organization that's tied together, which when you think about it is really similar to joining the monastery, the brotherhood, Mm -hmm. the... Of the Abbey. And that is something which is really kind of foreign to the Western mm-hmm. world. The idea of adopting somebody into the family and giving them the business. We focus I mean, so much on professionalism and boundaries, which are also important. It's very interesting to see that these older businesses not necessarily sacrificed professionalism, but encouraged an extremely personal and, in many cases, sacred bond, and still do. Mm-hmm. You have those, and then lastly, they have the focus on the customer and on staff, making it so that the staff wanted to serve the customer. Well, and more so than the, um, also focusing on the needs of the customers and the employees more than shareholders and increasing profits. Right. Really kind of turned it on its head, figuring out that, hey, longevity and profitability depended upon making sure that your employees wanted to serve well, and in that case, then pleasing the customers so that they would not only want to come back, but also rave about you to other as well. If you'd like to learn more about these two oldest businesses or uh, read more about all of the episodes of The Hidden History of Business, go ahead and visit our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. like to learn more about the subject that we discussed today, you can find multimedia content, links to articles we discussed, and videos on our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business and on Twitter as well. Thanks for listening.